Welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in to a, another uh, episode of Ask Pav. Again, fraudulently named because uh, I won't be answering any questions today. I've got my good friend and uh, <laughs> Uh, quite inspirational guy, Dean Stott with me. You might know Dean from, uh, from his uh, double world record breaking uh, ride, the Pan American Highway Challenge in his, his new book. So uh, Dean, I'm gonna hand over to you right now and I'm gonna give you a, a few minutes to, to explain who you are the, for the listeners and uh, attendees who might not uh, know too much about your background. Yeah, so I, I came from a, a, a military background. Um, I, I joined the army. Joined my family were in the army as well, and um, I was very uh, fortunate to go on to UK Special Forces. Uh, but I joined. I came from an army background, but I went to special boat service, which was a, a normal transition. Normally, you would go to the SAS, but they'd opened it up tri service, so decided to go down that route. And um, yeah, was successful and. You know, I, I did 16 great years in the military and I planned on doing even more. But unfortunately, I had a, um, a tragic parachute accident, which uh, shortened my career. Um, as I exited the aircraft, it was, it was called a hey-ho jump, a high altitude, high opening jump. So you exit the aircraft at 15,000 feet <coughs> and you travel um, towards the DZ up to 30 minutes in the air uh, or 50 kilometers of traveling. But as I exited the aircraft, my leg got caught in the line above my head. And unlike skydiving where you're clear of all obstructions, it's still attached to the aircraft. So um, my leg got pulled up over my head and to the right. Fortunately, my leg got released and didn't come completely off. But um, the damage sustained during that, I tore my ACL, my MCL, my lateral meniscus within the knee, my hamstring, my quad and my calf. So all supporting muscles as well on the leg. So <clears throat> after 16 years, I was told, you know, Thank you very much. Uh, time to move on. But all I'd ever known from the, you know, my father was in the military was that military lifestyle. So I then transitioned, which for me, looking back, was a bit of an identity crisis. You know, how am I now going to fit into society? And worked in the private security industry uh, without sounding like Liam Neeson. With people with our skill sets, it's the natural progression. And um, tried to find a niche within the industry and I soon identified having been out in Libya for 48 hours that there was a lot of crisis management and evacuation plans um, being sold to the oil and gas and to the NGOs but actually when you scrape the surface there was nothing there so um, thankfully I had foresight and I bought 30 weapons on the black market and I buried them between Tunis and Egypt and just made my own evacuation plans just stayed out there for a month there buried them in the desert and sold sold them to the oil and gas sector and, you know, hopefully never needing to use that. But I now found my niche. And um, in 2012, when the American ambassador got killed September 11th, I was there and evacuated eight German engineers from Benghazi to Tripoli. And then two years later, I was covering the World Cup in Brazil. And um, I was told that the Canadian embassy was stuck in Libya. So I flew back in and I single-handedly evacuated the Canadian embassy from Libya to Tunis. So I came home from that trip and that was my normal life. You know, I just thought that was normal. And my wife, um, you know, I think it's uh, chapter, chapter 16 in the book's called Dead or Divorced. My wife soon uh, highlighted to me that something needed to change and change quick. Otherwise I was either dead or divorced. But I realized then I was trying to match that adrenaline rush from when I was still in the special forces without actually coming to terms with the fact that I'd left. So my wife's a property developer and she said, look, you don't need to do this, you know, come, come work with me. But during that period of, that's probably about five years now from leaving the military to this point in my life, I'd neglected my own physical well-being, and my, my injured leg was now two kilos lighter than my good leg because of the muscle wastage. So I bought a push bike off Amazon, bought some uh, Batman Lycra thinking it was cool, and it wasn't, and uh, just cycled to and from the office, about eight miles there, eight miles back, but Straight away, being active again, just be, I just felt a lot better. I felt like there was a massive weight off my shoulders. But you can imagine with my backstory, sat in these architects and, plan, and planners meeting, I wasn't really interested in the heat system or the, or the plumbing system or the drawings. And my wife could see that, that glaze and she said, right, you need to do something. So, um, so I said, well, it's about a month, yeah, a month before my 40th birthday. So I was getting ground rushed. I was going to be an old man. I said, well, I've always fancied doing a world record. 
And uh, my wife then found the Pan American Highway, the world's longest uh, motorable road. So for your listeners, it's the southern point of Argentina to northern Alaska. But <clears throat> because of the curvature of the earth, it's equivalent to cycling from you know, London to Sydney and then 4,000 miles. So I thought, perfect, you know, I'll, I'll uh, apply for that world record, having only cycled 20 miles. And uh, Guinness came back six weeks later and said, yes, you've been successful on your, your application. But I wasn't a cyclist, and I, I said I ended up meeting you guys as well. I needed all sorts of uh, coaching. But I knew from my time in the military and time in the private security, I knew that I was good at planning and executing projects. And as I then evolved as a cyclist, I then introduced that into the plan. I just took a military set of orders and just crossed out ammunition uh, and, just, and just went from there. Um, so, yeah, that was, that, that was the Pan American Highway. And... Um, obviously I'm, I'm good friends with Prince Harry, so him and I have known each other for 13 years. So he was the first person I called to say, look, this is my, this is my project, what should we do it for? And heads together, um, depending where your audience is from, if they're from the US, might not know it as well as the UK, Heads Together is a mental health campaign, um, which at the time in 2016 hadn't even been launched. So Harry said, look, would I do it for this campaign? And I was aware of mental health within the military, but I wasn't aware about it within the, you know, the whole of society, really, from postnatal depression, young children, teenagers, all the way through. So I thought, perfect, that's the, that's the campaign that we'll do it for. And that, and that was it, yeah, then just a year's solid training, uh, trying to get sponsorship, the, norm, the, the, the piece that people don't see, which is the hard work getting to the start point. And um, yeah, I mean, a year later, I set off on the Pan American Highway. Fantastic. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it, was a great, it was a great story watching you and obviously very honoured to have been able to help you at the start. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about uh, just starting with the training. What was the training like? You said 20 miles was the most you've ridden on a bike and, uh, and then your, your aim was to, to do the whole of the Pan American Highway. So uh, what, was the, what was the progression like? I think for me, I knew that uh, mentally, I, I, I had it mentally, the endurance, but I'd never, I'd never trained with a heart rate monitor before. I didn't even know what a power meter was. People kept telling me I needed to be bike fit. I thought that was fitness, you know, and rather than actually the measurements to the bike. So I soon realized that I needed, I needed some training. I thought the harder, I was, the harder it was, the resistance pedaling, the better. It was clearly not. It's all cadence. But... So I got, you know, you, got you guys, you, you in first before you then disappeared and left me and went to California uh, and then got a local coach um, uh, here. And I remember the first week with Ken, it was like, you know, uh, look, you know, training peaks. Uh, it was Monday was five hours, Tuesday was five hours, Wednesday was six, Friday, Thursday six and Friday six. And I remember saying to Ken on the Friday, I said, well, what's, what's the purpose of the ride? He said, sorry. I said, well, what is the purpose of this ride? What's the objective? He said, well, five hours cycling, five hours, six, six, six. And I said, no, no, because for me, it's either five hours slow or five hours all out. Um, so for me, he then soon realized I needed numbers. I was very objective. I'd rather cycle 100 miles and do it in, in a certain time. So that soon, uh, he soon then understood my, my way in thinking. But actually, my biggest gains, especially for the first four months, <clears throat> wasn't so much the endurance rides. I'll probably do a century, one century ride a week. It was actually what you're on now. It was on the turbo trainers. It was doing an hour and a half, maybe two hours strength and cadence training. And that's where I started uh, getting my big gains. You know, mentally endurance, I knew I could stay on the bike for hours, but I just needed to improve on... I needed to be an all-rounder for this. I needed to be good at speed. I needed to be good at, on the hills and everything else. And then just all culminates in, in, into one. So, um, but actually, my, my sponsorship marketing team, when we did the SWOT analysis, which is the strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities and threats, the only weakness that came out was my arrogance towards the cycling community, which I just took as a strength. Um, you know, I didn't mean it to be, <clears throat> to be like that. Because, I, well, how come this guy who's like, because I weighed 90 kilos, I don't look like a cyclist, thinks he's going to go cycle this, this road. So, that, so I soon realized that cyclists love data. You know, I soon realized about that. They love data. And, um, and so I thought, well, look, I'll just put all my data out there. I'm not doing anything like this again. I'm not like, you know, when I chat to Mark Beaumont, he, you know, he'll put his route out, but he won't put his, his data. So I thought to win the hearts and minds of the cyclists, I'll just 
just throw it all out there. So I then started working with heart rate, working with power meters and everything else. But when it actually came to the day of the race, actually on the challenge itself, I, 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 my Garmin screen would only have my distance and my, my speed. I wouldn't look at that because for me, I, I, didn't, I didn't really, it's a great training aid, but I just went on how I felt. And I remember someone messaging me, oh, I think it was in Peru, and he, you know, because I had a lot of people following Strava. He said, how are you feeling today? I said, fine. He said, your heart rate was out the roof yesterday. I was like, was it? And I checked, and it was. Um, but there's so many other factors, you know, be it altitude, fatigue, you know, hungry, and all, all sort of the heat and everything else. So, and I sort of, you know, I just go on how I feel. That's how I train. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, uh, it's a... Uh... Uh, great to hear you, hear you say some of that stuff. It's really relatable, um, I'm sure, for a lot of the a lot of the, the stuff you talk about in terms of training indoors. Uh, I'm wondering if you've got a uh, a favourite session that you like to or hate to do, maybe indoors that you you remember. Obviously, I live in Aberdeen in Scotland, so you know when it's cold, it's cold here, um, which is great for for when I got to Alaska in Canada. But um, obviously close, so I set off in February. So that winter, I couldn't really take the risk of going out and getting injured. So a lot of my training was, was indoors. So I built a pain cave in the house and we had like the plasma screen and you know caught up on a lot of the box sets. But I remember doing a few century rides on Zwift. And um, but yeah, quite difficult. And I think a turbo train, I generally find harder than, than cycling. It's a great, um, it's great for training, but then nothing beats being on the on the road. And as you know, recently I've just done a 288 mile turbo train ride in a day from London to Paris, and you know that's that's probably one of my my hardest rides. But I looked at the I looked at the areas that I'd be cycling through, and I tried to replicate that in my training. So Chile, <clears throat> the Atacama Desert, is the driest non popular desert in the world. It was 47 degrees. <laughs> for a week with no shade when I went through but to replicate and being in the military I've operated in the jungle the desert the Arctic but I've never done it on a bike for eight to ten hours and I didn't want to take that risk so I flew out to Dubai for two weeks and did heat training out there so I could satisfy myself and then altitude wise you know I think the biggest climb on the Tour de France you'll know more than myself is about 21 23 kilometers depending on the route well, my biggest climb was 67 kilometers from sea level to four and a half thousand meters in a day. So again, I've been at altitude and I've been at depth. So um, thankfully for me, when I used to travel down to London, there's a place called the Altitude Center and the room is simulated at altitude. Um, so I went in there and probably the hardest bike ride up until that point was a, a 10 hour what bike session uh, at altitude. Um, but again, just to satisfy myself that under duress, you know, I, I could do it. But on the day of the race, when we got to Ecuador, I was fine as a support team, the documentary team all went without two signals. Awesome. Uh, yeah, there's some, there's some great, um, great examples of uh, how to force that adaptation or get your body used to stuff there. Um, I yeah. guess, best question right now, bringing you backwards a little bit to, to when you said you did your, the centuries or even the, the 200 odd mile on Zwift. Um, what is the best piece of advice you could offer someone who is uh, forced or struggling with those long rides and having to do them indoors? Um, I use a quote that I used to use as an instructor when I was on the commando course, and I, I still use it in, in everything I do. And it's anticipation is worse than participation. And that's don't overthink it too much. I mean, Fantastic. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so let's uh, uh, just... Just for the audience who we've got, we've got a great little audience again today. If anyone's got any questions at any point, uh, you can use the uh, chat feature to, to send them to me. Uh, uh, or uh, you can put your hand up. There's a little icon. You can put your hand up in it. Uh, but we will open it up at the end for uh, people to have an opportunity to ask Dean questions. Uh, Dean, let's talk about the ride itself. But you've already said that you've kind of gone from 40-odd degrees in the desert uh, to what I imagine is... I guess it was below zero in Alaska, in Canada. Yeah, it went from uh, the hottest was 47, then minus 18. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally went through, and, and that's what I think that was what I was attracted to about that, that challenge. It literally covered all sorts of <laughs> temperatures, terrains, cultures, uh, and issues. But I think, sort of going back, I, when I started um, 
when Guinness had come back, so when I played for the world record, it was 125 days, Scott Napier had it. And six weeks later, when Guinness came back, Carlos had already beat it by eight days. So the new world record was 117 days. So I started buying magazines. Um, I started um, reading books that people had done the route themselves. But I thought, well, the best people to ask are those that have done it before. So, you know, one thing we do in the Special Forces, when we used to come off the ground, um, operations before we even go clean our weapons or do anything else we'd have what's known as a hot debrief and the three main questions are what worked what didn't work and if you're going to do it again what would you do differently so I thought well why not ask those questions to those that have done it before me so I asked Scott spoke to Carlos I met Axel and Andreas who had the South America world records um, uh, I met them in Dubai and Mark Beaumont and um, they all started in Alaska and finished in Argentina, but all their issues were in South and Central America. So I thought, well, why take a gamble with the second half of the challenge? Why not turn it on his head, address those issues early? And then when we get into America, we can adjust the mileage. So one thing I'm quite proud of is actually just because everyone did it that way, it didn't mean it was the right. And I turned it on its head and set off from Argentina um, to Alaska. I, the world record was uh, 117 days, as I mentioned, but when I started put planning on paper and, and everything, there's so much, I always say there's, there's more to grabbing a banana and a water bottle and cycling north. You know, it's like there's a lot involved in the planning element, as you all know, with Route 66. And, um, but, you know, I, I could look at potential uh, issues and I always have a secondary plan and a tertiary plan, but those things that are out of your control, be it natural disasters, coups, third party influence. So if I encountered that on my challenge, I didn't have any sort of secondary plan to deal with that. So I gave myself a week's fudge. So should we have an issue to et into that week and it didn't eat into the world record. So I was always aiming for 110 days. And it wasn't because I wanted to smash it by a week because I wanted it, if we had issues, we could we get that. So I set off from Argentina. And it was, you know, a hundred plus day challenge and you know it's going to be, you, you know you're going to have hard times at some point but I didn't expect it from the off I had 40 mile an hour crosswinds and you know I live in Scotland I'm used to winds but this wind was relentless it just blew straight through there was no gaps in the wind at all and on day two my good leg had like a sharp stabbing pain in the knee and I was like oh my god um so we got off the bike and we checked the bike fit we checked the cleats and everything was fine so we videoed me filming and sent it back to UK to some analysts and because of the strength of the wind, I was cycling at a 45 degree angle to keep the bike straight. Um, so it was the torsion in the knee which was causing the pain. But then a week later, but you can imagine day two, a hundred plus day challenge, you're already in pain, you know that. But a week later, once the winds had subsided, then, then the pain had subsided. Um, you know, I got to, got to Chile and then the, 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 uh, the weather got a lot better. Uh, I got a lovely tailwind through Peru. Uh, that's 2,500 kilometers of tailwind. Um, so, so I took real, real advantage of that. And to be honest, the, when you think about the Pan American Highway, you think of, you know, there's going to be gravel tires a lot of this. Um, and actually, for South America, there was only a 10 kilometer stage between the border between Chile and Argentina, which was no man's land. Uh, other than that, it was, was nice, uh, nice road tires. And, um, you know, I think that that sort of helped uh, uh, as well. It, it wasn't without issues. I crashed the bike in Chile, you know, I hit a sign, I just went to limbo the sign and actually wasn't aware of the bar that ran across the bottom. Uh, I got food poisoning twice in Peru. Uh, I got knocked off my bike in Colombia. So yeah, there, there was issues along, uh, along the way. Um, but because of those games, I got to Cartagena in 48 days. I took 10 days off the previous world record. So um, that was a great boost going into the second half of the, uh, of the challenge. And I mentioned South North was a good decision from a cycling perspective. From a logistics perspective, wasn't. If you take a vehicle from Alaska, you can take it all the way down to Argentina if you cross the Darien Gap. Coming South North, we had to change vehicles in every country. So that was sort of slowing us up. So we had um, an RV and a four by four bought in Fort Lauderdale. It was meant to get shipped to Panama. And my wife got a phone call uh, two weeks before I was in Ecuador, saying the vehicles hadn't been loaded in the container and I was still sat in Fort Lauderdale. So my wife, my PA, 
and two of my mates, again at Foresight, flew out. And they drove the vehicles 4,000 miles in eight days from Florida all the way through Mexico, through Central America. And so when I, I broke the world record in the morning in Cartagena, I flew over to Panama at lunchtime and an hour later they handed over the keys. So very much a big, um, uh, a big help towards the, the campaign. Everyone sees the person on the bike and gives him kudos, but actually it's the, it's the team around you. And so I got, to, um, I got to North America on day 17. I was at perfect. I'm 14 days ahead of the world record. I can take my foot off the gas um, if I need to for a day or two, uh, if, if we need it. And um, I don't know, I didn't realize why getting to North America was such a big boost. I didn't know whether it's because everyone spoke the same language, the culinary options were a lot better. Um, I just don't know. Or having spoken to the previous record holders, I shouldn't expect any issues from North America, Canada onwards. We, we've left that behind us. Within an hour of getting into uh, America, my wife, I had five missed calls off my wife. My wife's very good at keeping distractions away from me, so I assumed there was a problem with my kids. And I got off the bike <coughs> and called her. And she said that we've been kindly invited to Harry and Meghan's wedding. It's just changed the dynamics completely of this campaign. So for me to get home for this wedding, I had to be finished by day 102, which is 15 days ahead of the world record. So going into the phone call, I was 14 days ahead of the world record. 10 minutes later, I'm a day behind. So yeah, it's nice to be invited, but I was absolutely fretted. It's just taken the legs off me um, completely. So the next day, I got to Lubbock in Texas, and we had 60 mile an hour winds and tornadoes. So I was grounded for another 24 hours. But I don't know, have you heard of a, um, an app called Windy TV? No. So the two, the two gentlemen I met in um, Dubai who had the South America world rec record, Axel and Andreas, they, kept, they told me about this app called Windy TV, which is popular with sailors. Um, but it gives you the strength and directions of the winds forecasted every hour for the next two weeks. And it's about 95% accurate. It was like my second wife on this challenge. I was just like ah, looking at Windy TV all the time. So when we were stuck in, in Lubbock, I wrote, I, I sat down and uh, put pen to paper. So to get out of Lubbock, I had to cycle 340 miles in the next 36 hours to miss the next weather window. But the luxury we had in America, which we didn't have in South and Central, is that you could cycle at night. It was a lot safer. Um, so that, that really helped for that. So I just played chess with Mother Nature with Windy TV in North America. I had 17 days planned for it. I did it in 11 and a half days. I got to Cheyenne in Wyoming and picked up a beautiful tailwind and did 260 miles in 11 hours with 10,000 feet of climbing. So I was also using it to my, to my advantage. And so I got to a place called Whitehorse, about a week outside of, of the finish line. I thought, right, world record's secure unless I get eaten by a grizzly and, and this, this, I'm going to this wedding. And um, I then got a phone call um, from a mate who said, oh, this guy, a guy called Michael Strasser, he's got three other world records, um, endurance world records, has come out on social media today and said he's going to do the Pan American Highway in August and be the first man to do it under 100 days. I thought, great. So that just changed the dynamics completely. You know, every time I thought I was making gains, someone kept moving the objective. And so I, um, I cycled for 22 hours in the last 30 hours in minus 18 to make sure that I came in. But the last two days, I had 250 days to do the last two days. And I thought, well, I'll do 150 miles today. It leads me a century ride and I'm well in under the time. You know, I'm in under the 100 days. I did the first 50 miles and I got to a, a roadblock. Uh, and this is Dalton's Highway. So the last 400 miles is where they film ice truckers. And this is, this is, I'm on Dalton's Highway at this point. My wife and my kids are in, they've all flown into Prudhoe Bay. I've not seen them in about four months. So I'm just wanting to get there and get it done. So the first 50 miles complete. I mean, I'm, yeah, there's roads, this roadblock and this woman's like, ah, nah, you can't pass until eight o'clock tonight. We're, we're doing work. And I was at, and no, health and safety, they didn't. I, I, they, I they took eight hours off me straight away. So I had a right little meltdown. Got into the vehicle and I just put pen to paper and I said, right, I will continue cycling from eight o'clock tonight until I get there. So it was 200 miles and I did it in, in 24 hours, but it was not eight to nine at a push 10 mile an hour because of the strong winds. And I just, uh, for me, I just wanted to get in because if I didn't give it my all, 
um, I wouldn't be happy with myself. And um, but yeah, I came in under the hundred days. So um, yeah, so it wasn't the original plan. It's how how things, how situations change on the ground, and how you react to them as well. Absolutely. Well, fantastic and well done. Has Strasse beaten it since? Or yeah, yeah. So I met. Yes. Uh, yeah, I met. Uh, he did. He did beat it. He gave me about three months to hold the record and beat it. But uh, so obviously the, the cycling community were were annoyed with my arrogance. But I met him in. Um, I met him in uh, in Vienna. He's an Austrian guy, but and I went out cycling with him and and his fiance. And she said, and he said as well. He said I put him under so much pressure because he's sponsored by Red Bull, Austrian team. He's got all the big brands. And they said, well, you better do it because it's. 41 year old guy who's never cycled before has just done it so for, but he said you know what he can what he can never take from me is that legacy that i came became the first man in history to do it under 100 days and i think there's been a couple other that have gone in under the 100 oh, well was, you were yeah. first under 100 mate so well done fantastic yeah. effort so we've got a few questions um cool. first one we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh nutrition improvisation so uh, for you, this would probably be what you could eat uh, while you are going through various countries, what's available. Uh, but for our listeners um, who might just be doing century, double centuries, rides like that, that maybe they're doing it self-supported, what would your best advice be for nutrition uh, on the go when you can't bring like a, like a, a, a packed lunch? You, know? <laughs> you can't yeah. stock anything. You haven't got a, a sag wagon. You haven't got any support what would your best advice be get older eat whatever you can so I, I think for me with this challenge so i started you know if if, I, if they had it my way ken he'd probably have me starting on day one as thin as that 10 two three percent body fat but i sort of took my knowledge from my time in the military that you you approach these challenges 80 75 80 percent fit carrying timber and, you, and you'll lose it so because this challenge was almost like a polar expedition i was losing weight from day one until the end so it's very easy back here to say right your nutrition plan is going to be this this is this but when you're out there it's whatever's available i, I got to argentina it's like the bottom end of the earth and it was like it was cheese and ham or ham and cheese whichever way you looked at it and um so that's all i would have and then we got to chile and it was chicken and rice but fortunately there were service stations and there were shops that we could replan on pasta and everything else. But um, every time we crossed the borders, they would also take the food off us, so we'd have to like find find more food. So um, I, I started cycling just for the age of uh, the age of forty, like I said. So you know, I, I spoke to like of SIS and things like that with the gels, and, and for me, it's just whatever I can eat naturally. Um, and I, I, if you train like that, then when you're out there, it's just whatever whatever is available. But you know, I was burning nine to 12,000 calories a day um, and your body can only consume 7,000 through food. The rest has to come through through fluids. Um, so I, I lost 12 kilos. I started at 90 kilos and finished it at 78. I just couldn't put on, uh, um, just take on enough food. I think I put on weight in America. I think I've got some, uh, some double <laughs> donuts. Um, absolutely, absolutely. So we got, uh, thank you for that one. Uh, next question is coming from Ben, and I love this question, Ben, so thank you. Uh, it's something, is there something about uh, people who have served in the Special Forces uh, that lend themselves to this sort of thing, uh, either mental or physical? Um, he says that there's lots of stories about, of insane feats of endurance coming from those who, are, who have served. Yeah, I think when you leave, it's, uh, you know, I, mean, I call it filling the void. You're so used to pushing yourselves and competing at the highest level, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of parallels between special forces and professional sports uh, sports people that you, you you spend your career building yourself up to be to, to compete at the highest level. And then whether you have an injury or retire, it's it's how do you sort of match that? Um, so for me, the, the only reason I did this is so I wasn't burying weapons in Libya and smuggling people across borders. I didn't actually want to do it. My wife, I was going to cycle Aberdeen to Dundee. My wife found the Pan American Highway. She clearly wanted me out of the house. So I um, sort of fell into it by accident. I didn't see it as then, you know, having books or doing guest speaking or, or, or future challenges. But, um, but I generally believe that anyone can break a world record. I, I'm not just saying that. You know, I was very fortunate because my wife takes away all those distractions. My wife was running the businesses, she was sorting out the mortgage and everything else. All I had to focus on was training. And I think 
anyone in your audience, if they had that luxury, then yes, anything's achievable. Thank you, Dean. Um, the next question's from Ewan. Um, so everybody has uh, hard days. Um, you've mentioned a few of yours. How do you get through it mentally, uh, especially if you have something like an injury or a pain that you, like you mentioned earlier? Uh, do you just block it out or do you just accept it? Um, with, the, with the pain, I, I sort of had to accept it. I, I just didn't... Um, you obviously... I'm, I'm a bit older now. When I was younger, like any sort of pain, you just, just grizz through it. And then they realise that actually that doesn't work. So I was always conscious of that. Um, but hard days wise, I was very, you know, I get the question at any point, did you think you were not going to do it? But um, when I, what I made sure that I do is that I stay on the bike until I'd hit the, the target, hit the objective of that day. So if you have strong winds or whatever, and you're like 10 miles behind, you know, for me mentally going to bed that night, I'm in a better headspace if I've hit the objective that day, rather than knowing the next day I've got miles to catch up because you don't know what's going to happen the next day either you could have another bad day you know there could be issues other issues that are out of your control i mean you're 20 to 30 miles behind so i always made sure for my own mental um, well-being is that i i hit my objective for that for that for that day so i was in a good place the next day and i think the worst position i was in at the end of the first week with those strong winds was i was 39 miles behind target but my target was still a week ahead of the world record and then it just changed then and then I, mean, I carried on. But I break it down, you know, you know, 14,000 miles or 22,000 kilometers, you know, for a lot of people, that's not even getting on the flight. You know what I mean? So for me, it's like special forces selection is six months long. On day one, you don't think about getting your beret and belt six months later. You just concentrate on what you've got to do that day. And, and, and it's almost like, you know, chipping away at the iceberg. And so that's what I did for this. I broke it into into countries um, broke the countries into days and broke the days into four stages so all i would do is have breakfast and i would just cycle as fast as i could for two hours and um that first two hours would almost give me a time appreciation for the rest of the day with the winds um then i'd be off my bike because uh, nutrition and hydration were key get some more food and water on but i was disciplined very sort of military style discipline in my time it was 30 minutes and i was back on the bike and i wasn't having a selfie with a llama or chatting to the documentary team and then all i would then do was just look at the next two hours don't look at the afternoon don't look at the next day so for me i was doing four training sessions a day i wasn't doing a world record and before you know it you've done a day you've done a week you've done everything else fantastic mate perfect answer a little bit under four minutes to go so why don't you talk a bit about your book Oh yeah, in the book. Yeah, that's what I read. So uh, yeah, so like uh, relentless. So I didn't, I didn't, um, like I say, I did this so I wasn't smuggling people across borders and everything. Else. I didn't see it as a career in guest speaking or everything else. And um, so my book pretty much covers uh, the first third is about my my childhood and the military. Uh, the middle third is about you know um, the Canadian Embassy, but there's a lot of other stories in there as well. I don't want to do any spoilers. I mean, the final third is is the actual. Um, bike ride but unlike other books out there i call them biceps and bullets where everyone's like doing these throwaway comments and cliche uh, one-liners there's actually some great stories uh, in there and um and also preparing for the next challenge so my i've enjoyed cycling I, I love the cycling community but i'm really gonna be arrogant towards the kayaking community next and kayak the river nile from source to sea so um just but just taking everything that i've learned from there and just dropping it to another discipline Fantastic, mate. Fantastic. Uh, Ewan wants to know if there's any chance we can get some signed copies for spokes, members, clients and fans. Yeah, yeah. so if, if you uh, go to www.deanstock.com uh, and click on shop, you can buy the books there. I mean, it'll come to us and we'll personalise it, sign it and, and get them posted out. And Fantastic. just follow me on Strava and Instagram and everything else. Um, I get trolled. I get trolled on Twitter when I, when I mention you. Uh, now, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 what's your take on that? <laughs> so, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you now, I had to sack my support team. My medic was bullying the documentary team and the mechanic and the, the soft tissue pair has got set, uh, sent home. So, they've now hidden behind trolls and just trying to do anything to, uh, to tarnish my name, but it's not really working. It's quite popular, you know, <laughs> lessons learned going forward. If you have a support team, make sure it's contracts and NDAs because they all have hidden yeah. agendas and trying to self-promote. 
business is and on the charity is actually illegal so they, they were warned and they were warned and then they got sent home so i actually right. had no support team from mexico onwards and a mate driving the vehicle <laughs> well um we'll, we'll leave it there fantastic having you on dean it's been it's been uh, it's been amazing so uh yeah on behalf of all of us that uh on ask have thanks for giving up your your monday evening mate uh, pleasure